I know you're working on problem set four now, but you should still remember problem set three. You note that I still haven't switched the web server for the class to run Zeta. It's still running on Apache, despite the fact that many of you were getting better performance than Apache is. So what's the main reason I haven't switched the web server to run on Zeta, other than me being kind of lazy and not having time to try to get it set up? Yeah, so I'm pretty nervous that if I start running the Zeta server on my machine that's got lots of sensitive data, like all your grades and other things on it, that I'm not that confident it's not going to accidentally serve a file that it shouldn't to some random person on the internet. So that's really the one thing that makes me sort of nervous about using Zeta. And you can see in the, the comments, this is in the reference solution, there's a to-do that might make it a little bit more comfortable. I think the way it actually does paths, it's pretty secure. It's also pretty limiting, right? So it's always doing, when you do a web request, it's starting in this path that was configured, that's the www subdirectory where you started Zeta normally, and it's only adding to that path. And it's not doing it in a way that appends strings that would be pretty tricky to get right. It's doing it in a way that's probably secure. But there's still things that could go wrong, and maybe something could be put in that directory that shouldn't be there. So that's a pretty good reason that if you're running a serious service, you don't want to run it on the data yet without solving this problem. In case anyone's not convinced why it's a bad idea to run a web server that might serve any file, we should, of course, Google that. Let's see the kinds of things that people serve up on the web server. So I'm Googling for DB password. Probably not something that web servers should be <coughs> exposing. And I get lots of sites that are serving their DB password. Some of them look real. Some of them are, are instructions. Some of them look like fairly real passwords. And this is just a Google search for DB password. So you can search lots of things that web servers will give you that they probably shouldn't because people have been careless about configuring them. Uh, you'll notice MIT is the first one that is exposing its password. So now, I should be clear. I don't know if that's the real password. And we shouldn't actually try it, because that could be illegal. Even if someone like posts a billboard and says, this is my password, log into my account, at least according to the law, it's probably still illegal to do it. I don't know if those are the real passwords, and we shouldn't try. It's good to think about how to break into accounts, but not to actually do it. We don't want you to go to jail. Probably those passwords should not be in Google's index. What was in the comment in Zeta was, we'd really like to use chroot. CH root does is just change the way the file system's interpreted. So some new directory is the root. So you've got your file system, you've got your old root, and inside root maybe was your uh, Zeta directory, www, right? This was your file tree. What CH root does is says, well, now I'm passing a new path, and I'm going to make that new path, that's now the root. So there's no way to go above the root of the file system. Once you've done a chroot, you can't see any files that are outside that subtree. So this can give you a fairly high amount of confidence, as long as you know that you don't put anything that you shouldn't in that subtree. If you've done a chroot, you're not supposed to be able to escape for that, see any files that are outside that subtree. Apache does something like this. Not necessarily using chroot the same way, but it is, as part of its configuration, you can set the directory that it will look for web pages in. It is designed to only serve files that are within that subtree. There are a couple complexities to this. One is that we can have links. So we could have a symbolic link. This is another option you can configure with Apache. A symbolic link is within some part of the file system, a pointer to somewhere else. And we can create a symlink using ln-s. This is different from, so I showed you last class when we were looking at the inodes, ln without the s creates a link, but it's not a symbolic link. So it's another file name that references the same inode. With symbolic links, we can have a file name somewhere in our inside this ch root jail tree. We could have a link that points outside it. And then you could follow that link and get to files outside the subtree. So that is an option for Apache, whether that's turned on or not. It often is, and it's useful to have it turned on, because it makes it seem like the file system that's there. Right? Otherwise, you could have things in your public HTML directory and not know why Apache won't serve them. 
So this is often turned on. So there's a better solution, or another part to the solution, which is much more important, and which is the real thing that I would want Zeta to do before I would use it for anything, anything serious, and that is changing the user. For a web server that's going to serve files for lots of users, and that's going to listen in on port 80, which is the default port for a web server, it has to run as user root. So in order to listen to that port, you have to be root. And in order to serve, if you've got a web server, but you've got lots of users on the same system, to serve files from all those users, you have to be able to read, at least have access to different files. So it's almost always the case that when Apache starts running, if it wants to be on the default web port, it has to be running as root. And this is one of the reasons your Zeta server, that runs on a port with a high port number. I think we use 4414 for it. But any port number over 1024 is open to users other than root. You have to be user root to use the low port numbers. What it does when it actually processes a request, though, is instead of running as root while processing the request, it runs as some other user. So this is sort of like the Android model. So Android is built on Linux. The main thing you want to do with Android is isolate all the applications. It's not usually a multi-user system in the normal sense, but the way Android works, every application you install has its own user ID. So it's running as though it were a separate user. That keeps it isolated, or at least is designed to keep it isolated and keeps it partially isolated from the other apps that you install. That's why they can't bash on each other's data, that they're running as a different user. And Apache is taking the same strategy of saying, well, when we process an incoming request, we want to reduce the privileges of the server so it can't do as, it's not as risky that it could do something it shouldn't do, like serve some file that's not supposed to be readable to everyone. We can see that if we look at the processes that are running. I started Apache. I'm looking at all the processes, and this is what I see first after starting it. So there are three processes that turn up when I grep HTTPD. The first one is kind of uninteresting, right? That's the grep itself, which was a process that was running when the grep was running. It's no longer running once I start looking at the list. What are the other two? So there's one that is running as root, and we can see that that one is still running. So this is after I do one request. I look again, and now I've got six of them running, or five of them running. There's one as root. The rest are all running as user underscore www. And I said, here's my configuration. I said user negative one, which is nobody. This server looks like it's actually configured differently. Right? It's user something, we don't know the actual number, whose name is listed as underscore www. But this is the user that Apache pretends to be when it's doing anything that doesn't need to be root, like setting up the original listener port. So how does it do that? Before we get to how, how to do it, let's make sure we understand why. So what we said we want to make sure is that our web server won't serve some file in response to a request, it won't serve some file that shouldn't be visible. All of these processes that are running as user www should be able to see fewer files than the processes that are running as user root or as some other user. For that to make sense, we need controls on files that limit who can see them. We have that. Access control is going to limit what users can do to files. So we'll limit what files they can read, what files they can write, as well as what files can be executed. If we do ls-l, we'll see these permission bits that are telling us what the permission bits are for that file. How does the operating system determine whether or not a file can be read? The web server is going to do, it gets the request. You wrote this in your problem set three servers. It tries to open that file. And if you're doing clever things like streaming it, you're going to stream it out. But there's something that you're doing that is depending on reading the contents of that file and then sending them out over the network. Where do we think those permission bits are? How does the OS decide whether or not a file can be read? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. So, yeah. So why are they in the inode? So they could, it seems like there are two places they could be. They could be part of the directory. I remember the directory is just a file, and it's got information about the files in that directory, like their name and other properties. But the correct answer, which you said, is it's in the inode. Why do we want it to be in the inode rather than in the directory? Good, yeah. So if it was part of the directory instead of part of the inode, you could have the same content be visible through different file names with different permissions. That might be desirable. That might be undesirable. 
So it certainly gets more complicated to know whether some content is readable or not. We can see what it does by doing that test. We've created top secret as a link. And so now I've got both of those files here. And I'm doing a chmod here. So we'll talk about those permission bits a little more. But that's basically saying this file is not readable or writable to anyone. What do we expect to see for the permissions for secret if they're part of the inode? So if it was part of the directory, this shouldn't change the permissions for secret at all. And that, in this context, it probably seems a little bit more sensible. If it's part of the inode, this should change the permissions for secret. When we look at it, we see that it did. Now there are permissions before for secret. It was readable and writable to me. Now neither one is readable or writable to anyone. Not a really useful property to have in a file that no one can read or write. But it's still there. And we could change the permission bits back to make it readable and writable. So these are part of the inode. And we can see that by looking at stat. You can see the permission bits. And they are here. That's the file node. You can also see that by looking at the structure of the inode. So we looked at this a few classes ago. The main thing we talked about in those classes was this disk map. This was how we kept track of the actual contents. But there's also the, all this meta information. The user ID is part of it. That's, I guess we can't see it anymore. But there's also the file mode, which is these permission bits. That's pretty limiting. All we have for a file is a fixed number of bits that indicate whether the owner of the file, what the owner of the file can do with it, what a group can do with it, and what anyone else can do with it. What we might like is something more like an access control matrix, where we can take all the potential users, all the potential files, and decide what the permissions are for each of those. Could create a file and say, well, Alice should be able to read and write this, and Bob should be able to read it, but Colleen shouldn't be able to read it. We can't really do that with the Unix permission model other than by creating a lot of groups. We could create a lot of groups and create a unique group for each file and use that group to control access for any set of people. But that's pretty painful with the Unix model. If you look in the kernel code, and one of the things we're going to do a lot in today's class is look at some excerpts from the Linux kernel code. Part of what I hope you're getting from Palm Tech 4 is you are seeing low-level code and seeing how the kernel actually interacts with machine resources and, and having to get the sense of what it's like to write programs without relying on any other programs and realizing how many things you're normally relying on. What you're not getting from working with Iron Kernel is much of a sense of what a modern kernel is like because Iron Kernel doesn't do very much yet. It's a very simple kernel that can't even run a program. We'll look at Linux to give you some idea of things that are in a more complete kernel. But if we look in the Linux kernel, we can see their file system, data structure has inode. Everything that we've looked at conceptually, well, this is just a data structure. There's nothing real special about it. It's just a data structure that ends up getting stored on the disk. The first item in it is this mode. That's where it's storing the permission bits. And the type of new mode is an unsigned short, which is at least 16 bits. It could be more. It's not guaranteed to not be more than 16 bits, but it's guaranteed to be at least 16. So we have 16 bits to store our mode. And the way it is stored is we have three kinds of people. We have the owner of the file, which for the file we looked at was me. We have the group. And we can decide which group has access to the file. And you can put users in a group. So this is one way to give fairly rich sets of people different access to things. But it's pretty painful because you've got to keep creating groups for that. And then there's others. Anyone who is on the system counts as others. We have three bits for each of those, which are read, write, and execute. We end up with permission modes with numbers like these. So what would mode 755 be? Turn that into binary first, right? To get a 7, we're getting all of these bits. Right? So this is 1 <coughs> plus 2 plus 4. A 7. To get a 5, we're doing 101. So what would permission 755 mean? Good, right? Everyone on the machine can read or execute the file. The owner can read, execute, or write to it. This is a pretty sensible thing. Right? If you produce a new binary from a compiler, this is probably, unless you're selfish and don't want anyone else to use it, this is probably the permission mode that you want for it. If you don't want it to be executable, right, that would be 644. Taking off the one bits makes it non-executable. 
if you don't want anyone to be able to do anything with it, it's going to be all zeros. So those are kinds of things that you can do with these permission bits. Not a lot of expressiveness, but enough for many of the things people want to do with files. If we believe this works, so we've got something in the operating system that's going to check these permission bits when you try to open a file and not let a user who shouldn't be able to read that file be able to do it, we're going to set the files that we want our web server to serve. What permission should they have? So if we want a file to be something that our web server will serve in response to a request, what permission bits do you think it should have? Yeah, it should be readable to everyone. Certainly, if, we're, if we don't think other people who can use the same machine should be able to read the file, we better not think anyone in the world who can get on the internet should be able to read the file. It's probably going to be something like this. There could be some executable files, right? This is actually part of the reason when we have the embedded shell commands, one of the checks that Apache will do is if it's not an executable file, it won't run the shell commands in. That's a sensible, sensible requirement. But most of the files should just be readable. Probably we still want them writable to us if we're going to be changing them. So what we want is when Apache runs, or when Zeta runs, it's going to change its UID to be some user that only ever gets the other permissions, that is not in any of our groups, and is not the owner of any of these files. So that's what this www user is supposed to be. That's the weak user that Apache is using that should only be able to read files that we really want to serve to the whole world. How does Apache do that? So we need some way to change the user that the operating system thinks owns this process. 